be happy. I gave you a questionnaire this morning. How do you know that God loves you? That's an easy one. I know God loves me because I read the Bible, and the Bible tells me that Jesus died for me. Well, if he died for me, you must love me. I also know that God loves me because God knows me better than I even know myself, because I can lie to myself and, and, and believe it, that it's truth. But God knows me, and I can't lie to him, and he still loves me, and he still died for me. And God took me from where I was and who I used to be and put me here to where I am today and who I am today. That can only be done by love. Because, believe me, if I met you and you were me back then, I wouldn't put you here today. But I can't read your heart. Thank God. Now, here's the different question. How do I know I have the joy of the Lord inside of me? Because there's a lot of us here that do not have joy. We do a lot of stuff that we have. Lacking joy. Lacking, and the same man who talked about love said that's the thing he doesn't have. Joy or peace. Where is it at? He's been waiting. He's been waiting now for over a decade for God's joy and peace. And he doesn't have it. Got an answer for that? Anybody? That's a perfect answer. The answer, in the end, comes down to selfishness. You open your heart and I shall come in. But you must open your heart. Very well said. We didn't hear it. What did he say? Oh. <laughs> you got to open your heart. Okay? If you don't have the joy of the Lord, or you don't have His peace, I said, in the end, it comes down to some form of selfishness. And Doc said, you haven't opened your heart. The choice is yours. Because, as Doc said, if you open your heart, God promises to come in to your heart. Amen. Is that right? Amen. But can God and selfishness sit on the same throne? No. There is not enough room in that seat. It's either one or the other. Now listen, that's just this one individual. When I first joined the church, I was excited. I was happy. I was learning about Jesus Christ. But then I got active in the church. And once you become active in the church, the church makes you more active. Amen. And if you have a willing spirit, they'll push you out all the way till you die. <laughs> right? And if you don't know how to say no, and I couldn't say no, they will just keep putting more stuff and more stuff and more stuff and more stuff on you. Yeah. And you're thinking you're doing God's work, when actually it's Satan who is deceiving you. It took eight years of being in the church to finally figure out how to say no. And not feel guilty about it. I'm one person. You're one person. And God is not calling us to do everything. Look around you, brothers and sisters. How many people are here? Uh, you too. Thank you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. How many people hold a position in this church? Raise your hand. 72 people. And I want you to look around how many people hold a position in this church. Okay? This is why once the church realizes that you're willing to work, we'll work you to death. Because every church I've ever been into, there's always multitudes more that don't do anything. Or very little. And very few who do everything. Let me ask you a question. Those of you in position, where does most of the complaints come from? The people in other positions are the ones not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> Steel toe boots on now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard my grandmother say, if you're not active or involved, you have no right to complain. Yeah. Amen. 
<laughs> Can you take the boat? Keep your mouth shut. I like that. Listen. The thing is, is that this is a church family. Is that right? Yeah. For some reason, you're here today. For some reason, God has called you here. Those of you who are members of this church, God has called you to this family. The question is, is how do we keep this family together? Get active, get involved in the church. I don't know, man, because when I got so involved in the church, I was ready to leave the church. Because I got tired. And I got burnt out. And I lost the joy that I had when I first came into the church. Do you realize it took me years to find that again? And I didn't find it working in the church. No offense. Okay? Because what I was missing was a relationship with Christ. I got so busy in the church that, and listen, I was teaching. I was an elder. I was doing evangelistic series. But my soul was so depleted in my own walk with God that I had become an actor. It's another word for actor? Hypocrite. Thank you. Hypocrite. Do you know what it's like to have to sit down and say and come to the realization that you have become a hypocrite? I remember thinking, thinking this thought that God has gifted me with this talent to be able to speak in front of a crowd, to talk to people, share the gospel. But I knew I wasn't living it myself. And I said, well, I can just keep acting. What do you think, Lester? It comes down to motive. Do the right thing for the wrong reason and get the wrong results. I could give my body to be burned, but if I have not love, it profits me what? Nothing. I could speak all these words, and if I have not love, it profits me what? Nothing. Nothing. It took years to come back and finally find the joy of the Lord. But I will tell you, how do I know that I have the joy of the Lord? Ask my wife. She'll tell me. She'll wake me up. Said, Wait, what? What's going on? She goes, you were singing again. <laughs> <laughs> really? Was it good? <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, I usually wake up singing. And when I go to bed, I usually go to bed singing. Some type of Christian song. Why? Because God lives here. And if God lives here, he will bubble up and come out here. And here and here, okay? This church is either going to thrive or it's going to wither on whether you accept Christ and allow him to live through you and in you. If you find yourself so busy that you do not have the joy of the Lord anymore, then you need to really look at what you're doing. If you never had the joy of the Lord, then you really need to see whether you are in Christ. Test yourself. Brothers and sisters, what tragedy would it be if Jesus came and we're missing something? Is your first thought, I don't want it to be me? My first thought is, I don't want it to be you. What am I here for? What am I doing this for? It's not for the pats on the back. Sometimes it's for the criticisms. What do you think, Lester? You're right. I was told when I first started, listen, the pastor took me to the side and he said, listen. He said, if you want to be up front, if you want to work for God in an upfront position, and realize that those lights up there get very hot. And if you're up there just for you, you are not going to make it and you're not going to last. Because believe me, it doesn't, depend on, it doesn't matter whether you have five people or 500 people, you will not make all of them happy. And there will be people that just are not going to like you. And no matter what you do, you're not going to make them happy. And they're going to complain. And if you can't handle that, then this isn't the position for you. I'm here to feed you I'm here to serve you what God puts on my heart to serve you. I'm here to serve you, not to be served. I'm here to show you Jesus Christ. And when I fail to do that, 
is when you as a body need to show me the door. And any other leader in here, this is what we're called for. And leadership, if you're not willing to do that, if you don't have the joy of the Lord inside of you, how can you talk about the joy of the Lord and share it with others if you don't have it yourself? You've become a hypocrite. Garrett? I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, ambition shouldn't be part of it. It's like the disciples in Jesus' time. They were fighting who was going to be the first. That's a real de deterrent. Listen, when I came into the church, I was talking about, to write about this last thing, uh, I had ambition. And ambition, I was 26, 27. I had ambition. Uh, it's funny how age and the grace of God changes your entire personality. What I used to be before I came into that church, that guy's dead. But when I came into the church, who I used to be and who I am now, <coughs> that guy is dead. But there are times he still creeps back up. Part but of human nature. Through the indwelling of Christ, we keep nailing him to the cross. You know saying? So listen, I'm going to close. Yes. Those of you thinking that, yes, I'm going to close. Let's continue to look at this and we'll close with this. Love does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, and it thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love will bear all things, love will believe all things, love will hope all things, and love will endure all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. There's one thing you remember today. Remember this. When you were a child, you thought as a child. But you guys, most of you, are no longer children. Quit thinking like children. When it comes to interpersonal relationships, you cannot be a child. The person next to you upsets you. You cannot be a child and get upset with them and just, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I don't want you in my circle of friends anymore. Okay? You're out to get me. Paul says, when I became an adult, I put away childish things. You are called to a love that is the love of Jesus Christ himself, and that's what he expects from you. If you cannot do that, then you need to get on your knees and you need to ask for forgiveness and ask for that love to come back. Amen. The closing hymn this morning is hymn number 12.